It was a great lesson in emotional coldness. Do your job or get out. That works, I find, only with certain people. Most people have an emotional element to them whereby they need, they need to feel appreciated. They need to feel wanted. And Williams never had that. I never got that. And I'm not sure that me as a driver ever performed at my highest levels in a cold, emotionless environment. And I see businesses like that, Brian, and I don't believe ultimately they're successful either. Welcome to the Beyond Speaking podcast from Premier Speakers Bureau, featuring in-depth conversations with the world's most in-demand keynote speakers. Hi, I'm Brian Lord, president of Premier Speakers Bureau. Welcome to the Beyond Speaking podcast. Our guest today is Irish driving legend, Derek Daly. He's the epitome of the complete champion. From the victory podium to the announcer's desk, Hall of Fame race car driver and network television color analyst Derek Daly has spent nearly three decades as the face of the motorsport world. Derek is the CEO and founder of Motivation, an experiential learning company and author of Race to Win, How to Become a Complete Champion. So Derek, thank you so much for, for joining us here today on the Beyond Speaking Podcast. It is my pleasure, Brian. You sound like my marketing agent. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. That's yeah. it. And I love the accent. Now you're from Alabama originally, correct? I am from Alabama. Yeah, the great <laughs> country of Alabama where they have shamrocks and leprechauns. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. Well, no, I love I love kind of thing. I grew up uh so I'm in I'm in Tennessee now, but I grew up in Indiana. We were actually in the blackout zone, so I never got to watch the Indy 500. We we could only listen to it unless we drove hours the wrong direction mm. uh and so but i've grown up listening to it you know my whole life and um and so i love love hearing about it my you know my my question would be where did you get started i love a good origin story where how did you get into uh driving formula one indycar so i was 12 years of age walking home to our neighborhood in dublin ireland and i see this green truck with sydney taylor racing written on the side of it and I was fascinated. I went to my dad, whose uh, business was selling groceries to the local neighbors. And I said, there's a racing truck in the neighborhood. I was all excited. And he said, at seven o'clock tonight, the lady who lives there, who buys her groceries from us, says, you can see the racing car that's inside. It was the very first racing car I ever saw, actually physically touched. It had a green stripe and an Irish shamrock down the middle. And my dad said, I'll take you to see it race tomorrow which was on a small village on the outskirts of Dublin city called Dunboyne. Brian, I remember the noise, the smell, the rush of speed, the color, the glamour, everything about it. And I told my dad right there, I'm going to be a professional race car driver. And wow. the, the weird thing about it, I was 12 years of age, right? 12 years later, having been to Australia as a laborer in the iron ore mines, because I'm very sophisticated. <laughs> Having been to the laborer, uh, to the iron ore mines in Australia to get enough money to buy a car, I made it all the way to Formula One because at the Austrian Grand Prix, every Formula One race has a Formula Three support race, mm -hmm. you know, for the juniors who are learning their trade and coming up. And in Austria, I qualified on the pole position beside a guy called Nelson Piquet, who went on to become world champion in Formula One. I'm sitting on the pre-grid with my sponsor, and this older gentleman with a bit of a shuffle and a limp shuffled up to my sponsor and said something to him. My sponsor sticks his head into the cockpit of my car before I went out to the race, and he said, that guy there said, if you win this race, he'll put you in a Formula One car by the end of the year. Wow. I went out and won the race, and I asked my sponsor, who was it? He said it was a fella called Sidney Taylor. <laughs> the first car I saw 10 years or 12 years earlier when I was a 12-year-old kid. So it was an amazing set of circumstances whereby I got myself into, into a position whereby he was managing a Formula One team, and he was from Ireland, and he thought it would be cool to put an Irishman into a Formula One car. So it was a remarkable success story an interesting story and all the different twists and turns along the way it really was so what uh what drove you to it because obviously you have to put in the time 
to become a great driver to be able to pick, be picked up, not, not just Formula One, but Formula Three or any level of it. Um, what were the things that it took to actually get there? So the interesting thing about wanting to become a professional race car driver in Ireland, we didn't even have a racetrack. Mm. And so what do you do? How do you start? And I, I, I took an interest in Formula One from an early age and our newspapers didn't even print the story. I would have to call the editor on a Saturday night to see, do they have any results from the race in South Africa or Argentina or Brazil or wherever it was? Mm -hmm. And so my interest grew, even though I didn't know at the time what direction I was going to take to, to actually become a professional race car driver. Wow. And so, so um, I started off in demolition derby, jalopy racing. I was 16 years of age. Um, might sound late, but at that stage, I was the youngest driver to hold a competition license in the Republic of Ireland. Because wow. we didn't do anything except play soccer. That's all <laughs> anybody in Ireland did at the time. <laughs> and so I went to, uh, uh, bought a Formula Ford, F-O-R-D. That was the lowest level of, of racing you could do in Ireland. Um, won the championship and decided to move to England. I had to move to England because it was the home of professional racing. But if I sold my racing car, which was the championship winner, I had a chunk of money. I could use that to either live or race. But I couldn't do the two at the same time. <laughs> well, the only way I could live is I bought an old school bus, took all the seats out of it, put some ramps and a door on the back of it, ran a racing car into the back, a sleeping bag and a, and, and a, uh, a toolbox, and said goodbye to my family when I was nine, 20 years of age. My mother made the curtains. My dad made the mattress. And that was, me. That was my motor home. My, my, my living quarters, my workshop, and the only way I could get from track to track in England. And it was, a, it was an amazing learning time. It truly was for me. Now, is that still parked somewhere like that you can go and visit or is it, or is it done for now? Unfortunately, it's in a scrap heap somewhere. <laughs> well demolished, but it, 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 did, its, it did its piece in, in the career journey. It really did. <laughs> well, that's great. So, so zooming forward a little bit, I, I, that sounded like a bad pun right there. Okay. Not zooming forward, moving forward a little bit here. Um, you know, where, did, where did you kind of come from to be that, you know, to reach the pinnacle of racing? What was it like? I know one of the things that you talk about in, in your presentations is the culture of extraordinary. So not just being good, not just being the best driver in Ireland. Uh, how do you get to be one of the best in the world? Like what's that, how do you take it up? that to that next level, that culture of extraordinary. So I can't honestly tell you that when I was 12 years of age, that I believed I'm going to be a Formula One driver. Formula One, just like it does today, because it travels the world and the most sophisticated racing cars on the planet. I can't tell you that all those years ago, I said, I'm going to be an F1 driver. But what I did vow to myself is I was going to do everything in my power to give myself the best possible opportunity to go as far as I could. And that led me to an amazing series of steps uh, and relationships that allowed me to develop my skill uh, and allowed me to, to, to meet the people and meet the teams who gave me the opportunity. And when they did give me the opportunity, I was able to, to deliver on the opportunity and it just kept happening step after step after step. Brian, I went from Formula Ford, the basics of racing learning, to Formula One in 13 months. Today, it's still the record rise for a junior level driver to Formula One. Second is Emerson Fittipaldi. You might remember his name. Yeah, he yeah. did it in 18 months in England. But 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 my rise was was meteor meteoric and 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 on, even even took my breath away at the time. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. I, I know everyone has these different mentors. I know you talked about your mom making the curtains, your dad putting in the bed. Who were some of your earliest mentors on how to work hard and how to be focused and driven? When I was 14, I had my first job, summer job in Dublin in a small backstreet garage called Larry Burns. And I saw Larry every single day arrive early, open the door, detail everybody's work and check on it every single day. And when they were gone home, he was still there. Mm. 
Mm. And Brian, I didn't know it at the time, but that was a model I was looking at. I didn't know I was admiring it, but I was absorbing it. And I, I re and and he he, he th this man was very Irish. He had eleven children. <laughs> His wife had her eleventh child when she was thirty-seven years of age. This was a beautiful woman, and still is today. I'm still in touch with her today. But I didn't realize the work ethic that he displayed, that I observed, that I absorbed, and that, that I think I, I used in later years because. The wheels fell off my wagon many, many times. And nine times out of 10, you have a personal responsibility yourself to make the first moves. Because when you make the move, people then will help you when they say you make the big effort. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that's really important it, to, for people to realize is that when you are a driver, it's, you're just one part of a larger team. What's the best team that you've ever been on and what made it that way? The last Formula One team I drove for was Williams. Williams Grand Prix are still active today. Um, that team and the Jaguar, the British Jaguar sports car team might be the two biggest, most successful and most influential teams that I raced for. Hmm. Um, and, and I'll give you a couple of, uh, for instance, the British Jaguar team. I was a guest driver for them because I was a full-time IndyCar driver at the time. And I got a call from Jaguar. Would you like to come and do the Le Mans 24 hour race in France with us? It's a big event. Le Mans 24 hour race goes on every year. Uh, the major manufacturers use it to make a statement. Our team, our engineers, our technology, our designers will prove not only are we faster than the competition, but we will outlast them over the long, long haul. So it, it, it really is a remarkable model. But that team, that team was the first team I understood had the formal structures of a big organization in place, but they also had the informal structures in place that allowed us to adapt and change on the fly. Remember, if you're doing 200 miles an hour, you cover the full length of a football field every second. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if you lost a second every time you made a pit stop, how far ahead your competition is? And so when I say the Jaguar team had the formal structures of the big organization, that's all doing the big stuff. You know, you know, this is how we're organized. But the informal structures that they also had in the company allowed the frontline mechanics, who we as drivers got on the radio to, when you're screaming down the pit lane, I need this, this, and this. There was no time for a committee meeting. Our frontline employees were empowered to make quick decisions with limited information at times to keep us in the game because we didn't have time for, for, a, for a chit chat. They had to do it immediately. And if you think about it, those two structures, what we called it was being highly aligned, but loosely coupled. Highly aligned because you knew your job and you knew the job lists, but loosely coupled means you could adapt and change on the fly. We called it intelligent decision-making to keep us in the game. And so that was probably the most impressive team that I raced for. The Williams team, it was a great lesson in emotional coldness. Do your job or get out. That works, I find, only with certain people. Most people have an emotional element to them whereby they need, they need to feel appreciated. They need to feel wanted. And Williams never had that. I never got that. And I I'm not sure that me as a driver ever performed at my highest levels in a cold, emotionless environment. And I see businesses like that, Brian, and I don't believe ultimately they're successful either. Mm -hmm. How do businesses like that, that may have a little bit of coldness, how do they get better? Well, the first thing you have to do is recognize it and want to get better. I get questions many, many times after my presentations. How do I get this group of guys over here to understand the culture of extraordinary? I'll say to them, sometimes you can't. <laughs> because sometimes, particularly with legacy employees, you just can't. Mm -hmm. And one thing I try and caution people is, is I'll tell them, don't stand up and tell people, this is what I want you to do. 
the human psyche has this funny thing inside, like kids. If you tell kids, don't look under that cushion, what do they do? Look under the cushion. Yeah. If you tell employees, do this, 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 and this. Instead, I tell them, flip it around. Try and make them aware of the personal advantages to them if they did it this certain way. And if they then see it and buy into it, they then own it. Now you have a realistic chance of them actually doing, fitting within the structure that you ultimately wanted in the first place. Mm -hmm. People can be forced. I tell people, you can't mandate high performance. But what you can do is set high enough standards and have committed and aligned people dig deep within themselves to see what can then be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, you know, speaking of, of uh, excellence and high performance behaviors, what are some of the, the most important high performance behaviors that, that you would recommend to a company or, or an organization, whether it is, you know, a racing team or, you know, a sales team? So I'm very lucky that I grew up in an environment that I think is the most amazing and powerful business model you could use. So, so, so it's exacting human performance that operates under pressure in compressed timeframes. Well, what does that mean? Brian, let me ask you this. If you were doing 230 miles an hour, coming to a 90 degree left-hand corner, what type of team would you like behind you? <laughs> One that put the car together really well and made sure it was working well. Right, right. And all these people are immaculately dressed in their sponsored uniform. They stand behind, beside their car, around the car, prior to strapping the driver in at a race like the Indy 500. So let me just give you a little insight to how they think. And, and I use this in the culture of extraordinary. All of these teams, all of these team members live convinced they could be beaten tomorrow. Think about that for a second. It's in their DNA. They take it home with them. They realize, hey, if we're not careful. If we don't watch what our competition does, if we don't stay one step ahead, we could be beaten tomorrow. And they hate to be beaten because they're brought up. It's an ingrained in them. We're a winning racing team. So that's part of how they think. They also understand critical performance gains are at the margins and at the boundaries of people and equipment, not in the center. So all the software you have, all the tools you have, everything you have that you can use to increase performance, you better be using them right out on the margins. Or if not, your competition will. And so, so it's, it's just a bit of an insight into how they think. All of these team members, Brian, disbelieve in the sustainability of their own performance. Think about that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if you won last week. Doesn't matter if you were successful last Sunday, you better disbelieve it's sustainable or you become vulnerable. And the winning teams, who has the target on their backs? And the more you win, ha, huh, we got it handled. <laughs> no, you become most vulnerable for the times of great success. Mm -hmm. I love this one too. It says, success in our, in our business needs a portfolio of leaders all throughout the team who have the uh, responsibility of leadership, regardless of the formal authority. You don't have to be told you manage that group. You don't have to have a name tag or a designation. By default, you are one of the portfolio of leaders all through the team that realizes I'm a leader. I lead my group, myself, my team at all times. And it just permeates all through the teams. So you see, Brian, how they think and how they operate. And I tell people my, my sport make great demands on people. It demands high performance thinkers and high performance behaviors. And I just gave you a feel for what that feels like and how they operate. One of the other great things you talk about is, is safety. You know, we book a lot of safety events. You know, as a driver, you know, you deal in speed, but you also have to be safe. And obviously you've you're talking about being on the margins. I mean, you've, you've mentioned, uh, you've, you've, well, I, I know at least from reading that you've almost been killed three times. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where does safety play into, to all of that? And what do you tell groups about the concept of safety and risk? 
So can you imagine the amount of parents that come to me at keynotes and say, wow, what did your mother ever think when you <laughs> strapped in? What did she think when you got hurt? And I tell them, look, we're in a risk business, but, but in years past, being safe wasn't a high priority. Being fast was. Mm -hmm. Now our priorities are be fast and be safe. Because remember, we're generating hundreds of millions of dollars of commercial sponsorship. And you can't expect commercial uh, 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 funding like that to support a, a sport that, that, that's callous and, and doesn't care about its people. And so I tell, I tell people, we now have crossed the road from just being a risk business. We turn risks into intelligent risks intelligent risks are when you can operate out on the edge of what might be possible, but you have the background like world-class preparation that you know this thing probably is not going to fall apart when you turn to the first corner at 230 miles an hour. Yeah. And preparation, our, our, our lives, Brian, depend on world-class preparation. It's not like in the NFL, I live in Indianapolis and we had Peyton Manning for 14 years here, yeah. right? And he was renowned for his preparation. He was meticulous. And I often thought if he slacked off one week and if he didn't care enough and went out in the game and didn't prepare well enough and he threw a bad pass, what would he lose? Down? At the very worst, he'd lose a game. In my, in my business, when you when you when you don't care and, and and you make a mistake at 230 miles an hour, it can be a lot more catastrophic. And when I tell people that, they realize, wow, okay, that's an interesting model. So you're going to go fast, right? Fast without reliability doesn't make any difference. Fast without being agile in the pit lane doesn't make any difference. If you use a second in the pit lane, you've got a full length of a football field. So speed, agility, but when you add flawless execution, i.e. preparation at a world-class level and flawlessly execute with good equipment, suddenly speed, agility, and flawless execution, S-A-F-E, has produced the safest work environment we've ever seen in our sport despite the fact that they operate out on the edges of what might be possible. But the biggest reason we now have that, Brian, is the attitudes changed. Suddenly people cared more. And you didn't just have to wear a helmet. You had to wear a helmet that was properly strapped that had a bulletproof visor. Because if a stone got kicked up at 200 miles an hour, it's traveling at the speed of a bullet. So suddenly attitudes changed people cared, they logged more, and we ended up with this environment that's got speed, agility, and flawless execution. And so it goes a lot deeper than that, but it's, that's, it's, it's an amazing platform to discuss safety with companies because it's so easy to follow because of the, the uh, business model that I've been, I've been uh, lucky enough to, to admire and, and, and witness particularly every month of May in Indianapolis. <laughs> Speaking of which, I know we're coming right up on the Indy 500. What are some of the things for the people who haven't seen it? I know, I know I'll, I'm sure a lot of people there, you've got hundreds of thousand people every year, but what's it like racing there and what's it like uh, calling the race? So let's start with qualifying. It's the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. to actually try and do four laps on the limit with the car trying to jump out from under you, and yet you're expected to run it on, on, on the limit. Rick Mears, who four times has won the Indy 500, said it, 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 it's the biggest thrill of his life and the scariest moments of his life. Mm. Then mm. when you start the race, you are going so fast, Brian, and you have to be aware of the long term because... You, you, you can never win it on the first lap, but you can certainly lose it. And to finish first, first you must have to finish. Mm -hmm. And reliability is so important in a race this long because you stretch the equipment to, 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 to the limits. But the big thrill for me these days is my oldest son, Connor, is now an IndyCar driver. Mm -hmm. And so two years ago, he led more laps than any other driver 
uh, in the Indy 500. Unfortunately, got hit by a wheel of somebody else's car who had a, an accident and, and blunted his performance. He still finished 11th, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, but can you imagine the thrill to see him operate at that level? I mean, my heart's just pounding. <laughs> he led it again last week, last year. Um, and in the test just two weeks ago, he was the second fastest driver to Joseph Newgarden, both at 227 miles an hour average. Can you imagine 227 miles an hour average speed where there's four 90 degree left-hand corners every 45 seconds? Mm. And here's the business model. If you're not fast enough, they black flag you off the racetrack and send you home. Mm. If you can only do 200 miles an hour, Brian, they consider you to be a hazard and they black flag you and send you home until you are good enough to stay up at the competition. Can yeah. you imagine what a, what a model that is? And I use that model, Brian, to engage the audience, to draw them in. I mean, there's nothing worse than saying you got a keynote speaker, you got to sit there for 60 minutes. Oh, here we go again. So I find, I believe I'm a storyteller. I'm an Irish storyteller. Mm. I happen to have a platform that's very colorful and engaging. And so I use the platform just to engage them, draw them back in, and then deliver the business message, which I think is just powerful. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. That's great. And by the way, you kind of beat me to my last question here. Um, so in addition to the Indy 500, I was, I was going to say, you know, we've got Father's Day coming up too. So uh, what is, I mean, obviously you're just talking about that leading for the most of amount of laps, finishing an 11th. Um, you know, what was it like when you first learned that he was following your footsteps and also at, at such a high level? So I get this question also from lots of parents, you know, what's it like? And Derek, you know, the consequences you've been hurt. You were almost killed. So, so, so what do you think of your own son doing something like that? And I would say I'm not bothered at all. And I, I want him to live his dream. If I'm really truthful, the dad side of me still sits back there in the backside of my head, hoping that everything's going to be okay, because I've seen him have accidents. And I know when I see it, when I recognize it's him and I see the violence, my heart skips a beat and jumps. So I know I'm emotionally attached and engaged to just him and you hope for the best. I'm just glad that because of the safety initiative that largely started in 1984 with my accident, mm. I'm just glad that the safety initiative has now given him racing cars, which is his work environment, that are the safest I've ever seen in my life. It is hard to believe a car can crash into a concrete wall at 200 miles an hour and the driver can undo the belts, get up and, and walk away. Such mm -hmm. is the environment that we now operate in. And it's, 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 it's a remarkable zone. It really is. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, Derek, thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing so much about leadership and culture uh, risk-taking and safety and, uh, and also about Connor too, that we'll, we'll be excited to, uh, to see him continue to race. So Derek, yeah. thank you so much for coming on and being a guest here on the Beyond Speaking Podcast. Good stuff. Thank you, Brian. Let's do it again. Thank you for joining us for the Beyond Speaking Podcast. To learn more about today's guests, visit premierspeakers.com. Make sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen.